It being two. It, uh, order. It being two p.m. Uh, we proceed. Wait, wait a minute, Senator Fifield. No. 2 p.m. We proceed to questions without notice. Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong, and I congratulate her again on her appointment. What policy reasons did the minister have for voting against her former Prime Minister, Ms. Gillard, to whom she publicly declared her loyalty in yesterday's leadership ballot? Order. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate for that uh, uh, question. Uh, but I have to say what it demonstrates again is the tendency that Senator Abetz has, uh, uh, that his, a number of his colleagues also have, uh, to personalise uh, debate in this chamber. And, and uh, I, I think that I have, uh, in terms of the question about uh, how individual caucus members. Sen are Sen Senator Wong, just resume your seat. Senator Wong, continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, and in, in terms of the decisions that individuals elected to this parliament make, uh, and all of us in this chamber on all sides of politics, with the exception perhaps of Senator Xenophon, at times have had to make these decisions. We have to make decisions uh, about uh, who leads our party, uh, and they are decisions all of us uh, weigh up, and uh, I have put my reasons on the public record. Uh, when it comes, however, to issues of policy, I would, however, remind the Senate policy which I am asked about is important. I would like to debate policy. I would like us to talk about things like how it is we can continue to create jobs in this country. Having, having a Labor government which has delivered 960,000 jobs since we were elected. Policy is important when it comes to economic management. And of course, this government has delivered growth in the economy such that we are 14 per cent bigger, 14 per cent bigger as an economy than we were in 2007. Than 2007, uh, and of course other policies for a fairer Australia. Uh, the delivery through both houses of Parliament of, the disabil of disability care, and only a Labor government would ever have delivered it. Only a Labor government would ever have delivered it. It was never, it would never have been delivered by the coalition, and they had the opportunity, as Australians Wong, know. Senator Wong, just resume your seat. There seems to be a debate going on at the other end of the chamber, which is completely disorderly, on both sides. On both sides. On, on both sides. Senator Wong, continue. Thank you, Mr. Senator, President. So I'm continue. very happy, uh, as is all of the Labor Party, to talk about policy and our plans for a stronger and brighter future for Australians and Australia, which is fairer Time's and expired. More, has more. Time has expired. No, 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 Senator Betts, you haven't got the call because there's, you're getting interference from behind you, and I don't think that that's fair to you. <laughs> now, when there's silence, I'll ask Senator Abetz to ask his question. He is entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Abetz. If the government was that good, as Senator Wong just outlined, why on earth did they need to ax the Prime Minister? But I ask, what if any changes to the policies of the Gillard government has the new Prime Minister, Mr Rudd, put forward to justify his return to the Prime Ministership? The Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I do find it uh, passing strange that a, a member of the coalition passing room, party, uh, passing strange that a member of the co coalition party room is seeking a, a, a justification for decisions that the Labor Party has made. Uh, we, 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 as a government, are very clear about our values and our priorities, and they are Labor values. They are Labor values, Mr. President. They are values which are all about an Australia just, just which wait, delivers. Just wait a minute, Senator Wong.
And when there's silence, we'll proceed. Senator Wall. Thank you, Mr. President. I was, comment I was talking about labour values and the importance of putting forward policies which spread opportunity across this great land of ours. I was talking about labour values and the importance of ensuring fairness in our society. I was talking about labour values and the importance of, so of ensuring decent wages and conditions for working Australians, of ensuring more superannuation and a more secure and dignified retirement for Australians, something the coalition, Mr. President, have always opposed. Let us never forget that those those opposite have never supported compulsory superannuation. These are Labor values, Labor priorities. Time's expired. And the values Time has expired, Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr. President. Given that the Minister has advanced no policy reasons for the removal of the Prime Minister, will she uh, indicate whether yesterday's leadership coup was therefore all about trying to save the jobs of Labor MPs? and had nothing to do whatsoever with advancing the true welfare of the people of Australia. The, the Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, the only time we get questioned about jobs on the op from the opposition uh, is in relation to political jobs. They never ask us questions about the jobs for Australians. They never ask questions uh, about how it is we can create more jobs in our economy. They never ask questions about how it is we can ensure that our economy grows, because, of course, if your economy grows, you can, you can ensure there is greater income and more jobs. Uh, it is interesting, isn't it, Mr President, that a coalition who professes to be interested in Australians never talks about employment generating policies or growth generating policies. They come in here day after day, day after day, and all they can continue with is relentless negativity over and over again. That is the form card of this opposition, both in this place, Mr. President, and also in the order, other place. Order, order, Send, send, send a bits. At the very dying stages of the answer, could I remind the minister of the requirement to be directly relevant? And the issue, and the issue was, Mr. President, in relation to any policy rationale whatsoever for the change of the prime ministership of our nation yesterday. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Senator Wong is being directly relevant to the question. She has gone directly to the point, and the point is. And the point is, uh, at risk of debating the point, Mr. President, she is pointing out that the alternative situation is something that doesn't go anywhere near policy, and the only time you mention policy is in the context order. of leadership. Order. There is no point of order. The minister has got five seconds remaining. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, uh, as I said, uh, we do care about jobs on this side of the chamber, order. and that's why we have always put jobs first. Time's expired. Send them more. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator McLucas. Can the Minister inform the Senate about the new dental reform package? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator Moore for her question. Mr. President, the Labor Party has a very strong record when it comes to dental health. In August 2012, the government announced a $4.1 billion package of dental health reform. There are a number of elements in this package designed to target the dental health of people, particularly those in need. $2.7 billion will be allocated to fund basic dental treatment for eligible children and teenagers from 1 January 2014. It includes $1.3 billion for states and territories to expand services for adults in the public dental system from 1 July 2014. $225 million will be allocated for a flexible grants program in 2014 to provide dental infrastructure in outer metropolitan, rural and regional areas, an area where we know that the dental health of the community is not to the level of, of, the, of the whole population. Around 3.4 million eligible children and teenagers between the ages of 2 and 17 will receive $1,000 over a two-year period for basic dental services such as checkups, x-rays, fillings and extractions. 
The, further, the government has entered a national partnership agreement with all states and territories to provide more public dental services. $345.9 million has been provided to states and territories over three years to provide dental services to eligible concession card holders. Over $1.3 billion will be provided over four years to states and territories under the National Partnership Agreement to expand services for up to 1.4 million low-income adults in the public dental system. $450,000 will also be provided over three years to support the provision of pro bono dental services to disadvantaged Time's groups. Expired. For answering the question, Senator Moore. Thank you. Can the minister inform the Senate on other government action on dental care? The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. The National Dental Advisory Council report delivered to the government in February 2012 said that there were 400,000 people in Australia waiting to access public dental services. These people were not able to get care under the Howard government's flawed chronic disease dental scheme. So that's why the government has invested $344 million in last year's budget for public dental waiting list, list blitz so that these 400,000 people can get the care they need. This investment is already flowing through, through and reducing public dental waiting lists. In addition, in the 2012 budget, the government committed funding to strengthen Australia's dental workforce. There will be an increase in the number of placements available on the Voluntary Dental Graduate Year Program, and there will also be an increase in the number of placements for oral health therapists in a similar scheme. There will be incentives provided to encourage Order. and Your support time dentists has expired for answering to the question. Senator Moore. Can the minister update the Senate on the closure of the Chronic Disease Dental Scheme? The minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Can I, can I advise the Senate that the government took the very sensible measure to, uh, to close the chronic disease dental health scheme? The reason for that is because that scheme was, was, not, uh, was, not being, uh, uh, was not being used appropriately. Frankly, we were finding that people were using that scheme not for checkups, not for, for fillings, not for uh, uh, particularly paediatric work. It was for caps, and it was for, uh, in many respects, it was for, uh, for, was for cosmetic. It was being used for cosmetic purposes. That's why, that's why our government took the decision to close that scheme and relocate that money to order, the appropriate order. area. Order. Senator Moore. Hear that answer. Order. Order. There needs to be silence in the chamber. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Moore. We took the principled and correct decision to close that system to, to relocate that money to those people particularly Order. in need. Order. Time has expired. Order. Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question is to the leader of the government in the Senate, Senator Wong. And before I ask the question, might I also congratulate Senator Wong on her election. I remind the minister of her statements about Mr Rudd in February of 2012 when she said, quote, there were a lot of challenges during the time she served in Mr Rudd's cabinet and further said, quote, I did serve in Mr Rudd's cabinet and I want to continue serving in Prime Minister Gillard's cabinet. I have made a judgment based on the time I have spent under both leaders about who I think is best to govern the country, and that is why I am supporting Prime Minister Gillard. Minister, what has changed? Order. The, the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. I have to say I find it uh, interesting that Senator Brandis would actually be wanting to raise comments uh, about leaders, <laughs> um, because I, I seem to recall some rodent comments that got quite a lot of press at some point. Uh, and uh, and uh, I, I, Senator Carr is urging me to remind uh, the chamber what was said, but I, I'm far too polite. I'm far too polite to. Uh, uh, to return to the issue of uh, Senate, Senator Wong, you just might resume your seat on both sides. On both sides. 
on both order on both sides senator cameron senator cameron order order Now, when there's silence on both sides, we'll proceed. Now, when there's silence on both sides, Um, you, you will get an answer to your question when there's silence. It, se it seems that people are more interested in entertaining themselves than listening, to, which is quite disorderly. Now, when there's silence, when there's silence, we'll proceed. Senator Wong, continue. Thank you, Mr. President. I suspect uh, some of the comments were more entertaining than I am. From the, the way, <laughs> this is true. I'm not an entertainer. Uh, uh, can I also um, th thank the senator for, for his congratulations? I, I was almost about to fall off my chair, but I did appreciate the graciousness. Uh, look, in relation to the decision that was made by any individual caucus member, uh, we, we have made that decision, and some of us have chosen to make our reasons for that public, and I'm one of them. I have nothing to add to that. Uh, in terms of uh, the approach that the Labor Party and the Labor government will make, uh, continue to make, it is simply this. As I said, we believe in an Australia where there is a greater opportunity for all Australians. We believe in a fairer Australia. We believe in growing our economy and continuing to support jobs. We believe in improving our education systems, our apprenticeship systems. We believe in making sure that we steer the economy through some significant and important transitions which are occurring at the moment. These are the priorities of the Australian Labor Party, and they will never change. They will never change. The values will never change. Uh, and those opposite might want to uh, get into a, a lot of politics uh, about uh, this issue. You know what the Labor Party is focused on and what the, the country is focused on, and that is uh, the plans of the future, for the future. What the country is focused on is, is what, what are the policies that the government is delivering, that the alternative government seeks to put forward. Uh, that, that is what the country is focused on, and we as a government are focused on implementing our plan, plans today for a stronger, brighter future for Australia tomorrow. Senator Brandis. Thank you, Mr. President. I remind the minister about her comments regarding the Labor leadership last year when she said, quote, My view is you need to think about who do you think is the best person to be Prime Minister, who has the temperament, who has the character, who has the determination and the discipline, and in my view, that person is Prime Minister Gillard. Doesn't her decision to abandon Ms Gillard and to support a person whom she previously considered inadequate to the office of Prime Minister all about her own self-interest and nothing to do with the national interest? Yeah. The, the minister. Well, the, the answer is no. And, uh, uh, what I again would say is the opposition do have the opportunity in question time uh, to question the government of the day about our policies and our approach. And I think it says something about the complete vacuum that is the, the coalition's policies for the future the complete vacuum of any idea, substantive ideas about how to meet the challenges of today for tomorrow, the complete absence uh, of any real plans to deliver outcomes for, for Australians, that they continue to focus in this question time uh, when they ask questions of government ministers, not on any policy, not on any policy issue, not on any policy issue, not on any issue, not on any issue that is of uh, relevance to the economic well-being or the, the personal and social well-being of the people who elect us and put us here, uh, but on the, a personal personal and political issues uh, with their usual relentless negatively, negative frame. Senator Brandis. Mr President, I note that the minister does not consider her decision to sack an incumbent prime minister a matter of sufficient note to be the subject of questions in question time. Order. I refer the minister to her statements this morning Order. that Order. her decision to support Order. Mr Rudd— You need to withdraw that. You can't say that. You need Thank you. I, I, no, Senator Brandis. I refer the minister to her statements this morning that her decision to support Mr Rudd was a wrenching personal decision 
the most difficult decision of my political life. Isn't it the case that her decision to change to Mr Rudd was entirely due to the opinion polls, not the good of Australia? The, the Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, well, we are always focused on this side of the chamber and what is good for the country. Uh, and, and, and we on this side of the chamber. Uh, that, that, is why, that is why we got rid of, the fair, of, of work choices. That is why we got uh, rid of, of, of work choices. That is why. Uh, uh, Sen Senator, Senator Wong, you might resume your seat so that. Now, the time to debate this, I remind honourable senators, is after three o'clock. If you wish to debate it, do it then. The order. The time is after three o'clock to debate the issue. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. That is why we abolished work choices, something I know Senator Abetz is still smarting over. Uh, that is why we focused uh, during the global financial crisis uh, on ensuring that we supported jobs and growth. And as a result of that, that is why we have an economy that is uh, continuing to grow that is 14 per cent larger uh, than it was in 2007. And compared, uh, compared to the fact, I know that Senator Brandis, I'll take that interjection, I know that he, you know, he loves uh, Mother England, but I'd remind him uh, that the British economy is in fact smaller than it was in 2007. So I'd make the point. These are the things we are focused on, focused on things like de delivering disability care. Uh, Order. And Time has expired. Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Carr. Minister. Given your recent statements that, and I quote, we need a tougher, more hard-edged assessment of people's claims for asylum, unquote, and further that, quote, they're people not fleeing persecution, unquote, does this signify a new Rudd government policy to change and narrow the legal definition of refugee designed to slash refugee numbers and put pe push people back? with the stroke of a pen? And is this the policy, Minister, you and the new Prime Minister will take to Indonesia and other countries in the region in coming weeks? Order. The Foreign Affairs Minister, Senator Carr. Mr President, what an impertinence coming from a party which has no policy on this or anything else. No policy on this. The position of the Green Party is that anyone being brought into Australian Order. borders by a people Senator smuggler— Senator Carr, resume your seat. Order. Order. Now, now when there is silence, we'll proceed on both sides. I'll give you the call when you— You deserve, you deserve, you deserve to be heard in silence. Yes, I know it's a point of order. You, are, you deserve, though, to be heard in silence, Senator Mill. On my left. Order. Senator Mill. A point of order, Mr. President. Uh, it's a point of order relating to relevance. Personal attack is no substitute for answering the question. Order, order, order. On the point of order, Senator Bob Carr. It wasn't a personal attack, it was a political attack on a party without policy. Order, order. The, the minister has been answering the question for a short period of time, but I do draw the minister's attention to the question. The minister still has one minute 48 remaining to answer the question. The minister. Yep. Mr. Mr. President. The fact, is, the fact is that overwhelmingly, if not 100 per cent, people being brought as asylum seekers to these shores are being brought by people smugglers. That's the transformation. And you won't accept the transformation. That is what has happened. That is what has happened. You've now got 100 per cent, 100 per cent of this awful traffic in human beings in unseaworthy vessels being brought by people smugglers. These are not cases of people under persecution, under persecution, who've cobbled together in their desperation, who've cobbled together money to buy a fishing trawler and set out on the high seas. This is people who've been captured by money-making criminal syndicates 
and you won't recognise it. That's the transformation. That's the change. The second change, Mr. President, is that these are increasingly not people fleeing persecution because they come in respect of Iranians, for example, from majority ethnic and religious groups. They are paying for passage with people smugglers. This is a transformation in the evidence before us. As the great Lord Cain said, unprompted, if the evidence changes, I change my opinion. I say that is the challenge for those people, those good Australians, who have argued a refugee case in the past, for them to re-examine their position. The evidence before us, economic refugees, not people fleeing persecution, are being brought here by people's Order. Is Time has expired. Order. Wait a minute, Senator Mill. You are entitled to be heard in silence. When there's silence on my left, on my left, on my left, when there's, when there's silence, it's not your question. It's order. It's not your question. On both sides. Order. Order. If you want to have a private discussion with people, go outside and have it after question time, but not during question time. It's disorderly. Senator Mill. Thank you, Mr. President. I note the minister didn't say whether the policy is to now redefine refugee for the purposes of taking a new policy to the region. But I ask, given that 90 per cent of asylum seekers have been found to be genuine refugees, what evidence, Minister, do you have that Hazaras, who arrived by boat, are not being persecuted by the Taliban in Pakistan and Afghanistan and are, and are economic migrants, as you tried to claim last night? Are those Hazaras persecuted by the Taliban and are they economic migrants? Order. Uh, wait a minute. When you've got the call, Senator Carr, you can proceed. And you'll get the call when there's silence. Senator Carr. Mr. President, that's how deceptive the Green Party is. I did not mention Hazaras last night. In the interview, I did not mention Hazaras. Look at the transcript. I did not use that word. I referred. I referred. I referred to the recent spike in Iranian immigration, which is overwhelmingly middle-class Iranians who belong to the majority religious and ethnic group in that country, who are coming to these shores as economic migrants brought here by people smugglers. Again, that crucial combination, based on the evidence before us, which your party refuses to accept. One, economic migration, not people fleeing persecution, and two, arriving here as part of a commercial criminal enterprise, that is, the criminal syndicate, that is, people smuggling. You ignore the evidence. You won't look at the evidence. Your Order. case has Time faded has expired. Time's expired. Senator Mill. Thank you, Mr. President. For the third time, the minister didn't say whether or not he's going to redefine refugee for the purposes of slashing the numbers. So I ask, how can the government or you be taken seriously in nominating Australia for a position on the UN Human Rights Council when you are prejudging refugees as economic migrants acting in total violation of the United Nations Human Rights Convention? When this silence will proceed, Minister. President, this leader without policies, this leader who refuses to look at the evidence, this leader who ignores the evidence of people smuggling, just ignores it. Just ignores it. Doesn't, so doesn't. Order. Order. <clears throat> Senator Mill. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my point of order is relevance. As I indicated before, personal attack is no substitute for answering the question. Order. 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 The minister has been answering for 11 seconds. I do, I do remind the minister of the question. The minister. The minister. Order. The minister. Mr. President, my sentence did have subjunctive clauses in it, but I'm reaching the core of the sentence. The core of the sentence, which is you're not looking at the evidence, and Mr. President. 
The evidence is people smuggling, economic refugees and a spike in numbers coming overwhelmingly from people who are majority ethnic or religious groups in the community they come from. The Green Party won't consider that. When people arrive in Australia without authorisation, any claims they make for their reasons to travel to this country are assessed by the Department of Immigration and Citizenship. If these claims are not covered by Australia's international obligations, they will be returned to their homeland wherever possible. That is why Australia has Order. and will Time has expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Uh, I refer the minister to Mr. Rudd's comments, comments last night, and I quote, uh, about strong, proven national economic leadership. Does Mr. Rudd describe $129 billion in accumulated deficits on his first watch as Prime Minister, including the two biggest budget deficits ever, a strong, proven national economic leadership? Why should the Australian people trust Mr. Rudd when it comes to the economy, when he broke his promise to deliver budget surpluses, delivering debt and consecutive deficits instead? despite having benefited from the best terms of trade in 140 years and despite his many new taxes, having introduced Labor's failed mining tax and the job-destroying carbon pollution reduction scheme, which of course eventually morphed into the world's biggest carbon tax. The uh, order on both sides, on both sides, the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, it was a sort of um, <clears throat> missing fact in that question. Uh, it was a, there was a substantial missing fact, uh, uh, and it was a pretty big fact. It's called the global financial crisis. The the, the largest uh, no, are those the, the, all the opposition do, Mr. Pre Mr. President. All the opposition do. Senator Wong, just resume your seat. Now, when there is silence, we will proceed. The minister is entitled to be heard in silence. When there is silence, we will proceed. Simple as that. When there is silence, we will proceed. The minister. Thank you, Mr President. What I was saying, all the opposition uh, demonstrate uh, to all and sundry, when they scoff at mention of the global financial crisis, is demonstrate that the Liberal Party have become the party of economic irrationality. Oh. Economic irrationality. Uh, and I would expect that, Mr President, from the National Party. I would expect that from Senator Joyce. Uh, but really, this is the party of Peter Costello. This is the party that used to pride itself uh, that it understood matters economic, coming into this chamber and asking a question about the last years uh, of our, in terms of our economy's development and trying to uh, completely rob out the impact to, on our economy and on the global economy of the largest downturn since the Great Depression. The largest downturn in the Great Depression. Senator Cormann ought to go to the United States or to the United Kingdom or to Spain or to Greece and ask them whether they think they should look at the last five years of their economic history without regard for the global financial crisis. It is the most extraordinarily absurd Sen economic Senator Wong, just resume your seat. I remind senators that interjecting is disorderly. Senator Wong, continue. Thank you, Mr President. It is the most extraordinarily absurd economic proposition. Uh, and if, if, the co if the coalition's policy is now that fiscal policy should never respond to the macroeconomic environment, well, they better tell Joe Hockey, Senator Mr. Hockey, that they better tell Mr. Hockey that because it is a ridiculous proposition and contrary to the way in which he has most recently uh, articulated that your policy, uh, in fact, as, as recently as this week, uh, in a speech. Order. Time has expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, given Mr. Rudd's criticisms of the Gillard Swan mining tax, specifically his criticism that it hadn't raised any meaningful revenue, uh, punching another black hole into Labor's budget, uh, will Mr. Rudd now join the coalition in our commitment to scrap the mining tax, along with the expensive promises Labor has attached to it, 
or does he intend to attach himself to the extreme calls from the Greens and Senator order, Cameron? Order. Uh, and Just wait a, wait a minute, Senator Cormann. Senator Cameron. Senator Cameron. The last part of the question. The last part of the question. Or uh, will he attach himself uh, to the extreme calls from the Greens and Senator Cameron and ramp the mining tax up further? The Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a somewhat strange question that sort of said uh, uh, on the. Order. 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 The, the Minister continue. The Minister continue. Continue. Thank you. I was just waiting for the constant repetition from Senator Macdonald to subside slightly. Uh, Mr. President, uh, as I said, a question that I think uh, suggested on the one hand uh, uh, that the government would uh, abolish the mining tax, but on the other hand suggested that, uh, well, suggested in the question uh, that we would uh, uh, have a mining tax that someone else suggested. I think uh, a couple of propositions about the mining tax, uh, which Senator Cormann does not agree with, uh, we have been very clear uh, with the principle that. Uh, 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 the Australian people own the resources uh, that are the subject uh, of this tax regime. Order. You've had your question. The minister is answering the question. Desist Thanks. from interjecting. Order. The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. We, we have been very clear about the proposition that the Australian people own these resources, and that is the basis of the rationale for the tax. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, President. The minister clearly wasn't prepared to rule out a ramp up uh, in Order. the MRRT. The uh, is, there, is there any chance that the Prime Minister will join the coalition in a bipartisan way in our efforts to scrap the carbon tax, to return the budget to surplus, to take pressure off families with their cost of living, to reduce the cost of doing business, and to help strengthen our economy at a time when the economy needs strengthening? Order. The Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, we, uh, uh, there are times in public debate where bipartisanship would be a good thing, but not when we fundamentally disagree. And we have a fundamental disagreement between the Labor Party uh, and the Coalition. The Party. Order. Uh, Order. About, about uh, for example, pricing of carbon. Uh, which the coalition used to agree with, and of course uh, the principle that the Australian people should get a fair share of revenue from the resources that they own. But I want to turn to one of the components of the senator's question, which was cost of living. I would remind uh, th the, the chamber, through you, Mr. President, that one of the principal policies of the coalition uh, has always been uh, to, uh, to oppose compulsory superannuation. Those opposite, led by a man who describes superannuation as a con job. Uh, and led by a man who is on the record as saying that his coalition has never supported increases to superannuation. Want to come in here and talk about things like cost of living? And the reality is, Mr. President, those opposite have never accepted Order. the need for a Time working. has expired. Order. Order. When there's silence, we'll proceed. Order. Senator Furner. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Bob Carr. Can the minister update the Senate on Australia's approach to assisting the government of Papua New Guinea address tuberculosis in, West, in the Western Province? The Foreign Affairs Minister, Senator Bob Carr. Mr. President, Australia's efforts to help the, the government of, uh, of PNG address tuberculosis helps treat people in their communities, treat them in homes in Western Province. This approach is based on the World Health Organisation's Stop TB strategy, and it's proved most successful. It's critical in the prevention of multi-drug-resistant TB developing and spreading. But there has, I'm sad to report to the Senate, been a smear campaign targeting Australia's impressive efforts to address this issue in a country that on average has 14,000 new TB cases diagnosed per year. And it's an issue politicised and sad to relate by the member for Leichhardt. He said Australia's life-saving assistance, this fine work helping PNG, helping Western Province, has been, quote, grossly mismanaged by bureaucrats, unquote. His claims have been criticised by, among others, Dr Smith Penai of Daru General Hospital in a letter to the Australian High Commission in June last year as derogatory and negative. 
The member for Leichhardt's opinion flies in the face of professional medical assessments, assessments made by the World Health Organization, which in November 2012, in its document, major document on this subject, on TB monitoring, found clear progress in TB prevention and control in South Fly since its last review. Associate Professor, Professor Emma McBride, the head Epidemiology Victorian Infectious Diseases Service at Royal Melbourne Hospital concluded in her report on this subject that the current approach, including treating PN Papua New Guineans in their own communities, is the right approach. But even the Queensland government itself, your poster child, has endorsed the approach. In a statement from the Premier and the Health Minister of uh, Lawrence Springboard, and the Premier, in a, in a press release on May 15, they stated, quote, that by Time has the best expired. Treatment. Order. Senator Ferner. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the Minister provide details of Australia's recent assistance to the Government of West Province to address TB? Minister. Mr. President. Yes, I can, uh, Mr. President. And, and our approach, the assistance, is based on that is confirmed by that recent endorsement by the Premier of Queensland or the Health Minister of Queensland, uh, Mr Campbell Newman and Mr Lawrence Springboard, who in a joint statement on May 15 said that, quote, by providing the best treatment in their home communities, the outcomes will improve. And quote, it's important to build on the effective TB treatment regime that is already established at Daru, unquote. So that's their endorsement an approach that has seen the refurbishment of an interim TB isolation ward, the construction of a new TB isolation ward to be opened next month, the provision of specialist TB staff, the training for 46 health workers and volunteers. This is effective Australian work, helping our friends in PNG, funding for laboratory diagnosis and drug sensitivity testing in Queensland, options and funding to redevelop Daru Hospital, Rehabilitation of the health has centre. Expired. Senator Ferner. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister provide details of Australia's border assistance to PNG's health sector? Minister. Mr. President, indeed I can, and I'm happy for the opportunity. Uh, completing, though, the answer on, on TB help. Uh, since May 2012, the sea ambulance we provided the province has made 27 trips along the South Fly coast to deliver TB and other medical services to remote villages, but all in the context of the great work we're doing in partnership with PNG, improving health services. In 2012 alone, we helped to vaccinate more than half a million, yes, half a million children for measles and polio and more than 1.2 million women for tetanus. We trained 187 health workers including doctors, nurses and pharmacists in PNG, and supported 20,000 supervised births. Our assistance this year will reach $105 billion. That's our assistance to the health sector of PNG. Medical supplies to 2,700 health facilities across the country, among Order. other things. Order. Time has expired. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I remind the Minister of Mr Rudd's statement of 2009 when he said, As Prime Minister, I take full responsibility for our immigration policy and its implementation. I also remind the Minister that since Mr Rudd dismantled the proven border protection policies of the Howard government, 45,189 people have illegally arrived on 739 boats. Will the Prime Minister personally take responsibility for the more than 45,000 people who have arrived illegally, more than 1,000 drownings, the chaos, cost and tragedy that has followed his decision to roll out the Rudd carpet mat for people smugglers? The, the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. You don't have to Order. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, I'm sure very distressing uh, for many Australians uh, and certainly uh, disappointing for those of us in this chamber that 
the Senator chooses to treat such a difficult policy uh, issue in the way she did. In the way she did. I I'm very happy, uh, Mr President, to have a policy discussion uh, about uh, regular maritime arrivals. Uh, I'm very happy to do that. Uh, it is a complex policy area. There are 46 million people displaced worldwide. 46 million people displaced worldwide, and the world has changed when it comes uh, to people smuggling uh, since 2000. The world has changed in many ways, uh, as Senator Carr in part has alluded to in an earlier answer. And I do not think, Mr President, that we serve the Australian people well to use something as tragic as drownings uh, in the way that was, it was used in that question, to talk about rolling out the, the carpet or whatever the phrase was in such a flippant way. We are talking about people's lives and we are talking, and we are talking about a complicated policy Senator issue. Wong, Senator Wong, just resume your seat. When there is silence, we'll proceed. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. We are, we are talking about a policy problem that will never be, never be solved uh, by a three-word slogan, by a three-word slogan, and it will never be solved by a party who does not even have the guts to raise their policy with the President of Indonesia when they have their chance. I mean, that really showed what feet of clay the Leader of the Opposition has, Mr President. What feet of clay has this man who beats his chest, has beats his chest, enters into this appalling debate in which he seeks to use uh, uh, what the tragedies that have occurred for political gain? Uh, and then does not even have the courage to raise his policy position with the President of Indonesia because he knew he would be rebuffed. Order. 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 Send a cash. Thank you, Mr President. A supplementary question. I remind the minister that Mr Rudd personally promised that he would take a very hard line on the question of people smuggling, a very tough line on people smuggling. I also remind the minister that Mr Rudd said just four days before the 2007 election that he would turn the boats back and take appropriate action as the vessels approach Australia on the high seas. Why did Mr Rudd break both of those promises, and how can the Australian people trust the Prime Minister who started the boats to stop the boats? The, the Minister. Thank you, Mr President. Well, in my primary answer, I referenced the fact that this is not a policy position, a challenge a di uh, that can ever be resolved by three-word slogans, and we entered, ended that question with two three-word slogans. Uh, and, and the reality is, uh, as much as as much as Senator Cash might enjoy and relish uh, the opportunity to try and create political mayhem with this issue, the reality is no. The reality is the reality is that this is a complex public policy question, a global issue. Senator, Senator Wong, uh, Senator Wong, just resume your seat, and when there is silence, we'll proceed. Senator Wong, continue. Thank you. And uh, what I would say is, we do, we do. Uh, the, the people we serve here, as well as those uh, who uh, make or, or seek to make a perilous journey, we do not do any of them uh, well by treating this issue as a political football. Now, I would remind those opposite. I would remind those opposite that the ambassador for Indonesia has made very clear their policy is, will not be agreed to by the Indonesian government. Very clear. Senator Cash. Mr President, a further supplementary. I refer to the Prime Minister's statement three years ago when he said, if I return as Prime Minister, this party and the government will not be lurching to the right on the question of asylum seekers. Will the government now support the coalition's policy to turn back the boats when it is safe and possible to do so? Order. Now, when there's silence, we'll proceed. When there's silence, I'll give the minister the call. If you wish to debate it, if you wish to debate it, there's uh, 12 minutes to go. <laughs> Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. The reality is uh, that uh, if you look at the advice from defence and border protection personnel. And if you look at the public statements of the Indonesian government's representatives, it is very clear that the slogan 
uh, of stopping the boats uh, and turning the boats back uh, is not workable. Is not workable. Uh, and uh, I'd refer you to Indonesia's ambassador to Australia when he was asked on the 31st of May, and he said as follows: "I think it's not possible for the coalition to say that it has to go back to Indonesia because Indonesia is not the origin country of these people. No such collaboration will happen between Indonesia and Australia to bring back the people to Indonesia. No such collaboration will happen between Indonesia and Australia." To bring back the people to Australia, and on top of that, uh, and on top of that, we have the advice of the Navy and Water Protection as to the risks. So, if, if those opposite believe that they, they can simply uh, fix this issue with a slogan, well, really, they are they are, they are misleading the Australian people. Now, when there's silence, I'll call the next questioner. When there's silence, send a mat again. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Carr. During Senate estimates in February this year, Senator Brand ascertained from defence officials that Australia had conducted no patrols in the Southern Ocean in 2012, and that the vessel ACV Ocean Protector, which can be used for those purposes, is being used in Australia's northern waters. Given the fact that our limited number of patrol vessels seriously affects our capacity to patrol our interest in the Southern Ocean, and given that BAE Systems has cautioned the government that it does not have sufficient workload to keep its current trained and skilled workers employed beyond the end of next year, can the minister outline what considerations have been taken towards bringing forward the funding and construction of the SCA 1180 offshore combatant vessels project? The Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Carr. Uh, Mr President, I, I, can inf I thank the Senator for his question. I can inform the Senate that this offshore combatant vessel was a 2009 Defence White Paper project to develop proposals to rationalise the Navy's patrol boat, mine countermeasures, hydrographic and oceanographic uh, forces into a single modular multi-role vessel. As outlined in the 2013 Defence White Paper released in May, Defence will continue to have the capabilities to, condu to conduct patrol and mine hunting and hydrographic roles. That Defence White Paper outlined the government's commitment to bring forward the replacement of Australia's Armadale class patrol boats, with both Australia's patrol boats and the Pacific patrol boats being, being replaced, preferably with a, a proven vessel. A multi-role vessel remains a possible longer-term project, subject to technological maturity and an ability to provide operational flexibility with lower costs of ownership. Similarly, the government intends to upgrade and extend the existing Minehunter coastal and survey motor launch hydrographic vessels until the longer-term solution can be delivered. Government decisions on the scope and the roles of future vessels will take account of the technological maturity of particular solutions as well as the remaining life of current vessels. But I underline, uh, uh, Mr President, that uh, this pro the, the project, the, uh, the offshore combatant vessels, uh, was there in the 2009 Defence White Paper project to, to uh, pursue the proposal of rationalising uh, the Navy's patrol boat and mine countermeasures, the hydrographic and oceanographic forces into a single modular multi-role vessel. I draw the attention of the, uh, uh, the Senator and the Senate to references in the 2013 Defence White Paper released in May. Senator Madigan. Thank you, Mr President. The Defence Department's future submarine industry skills plan states, as it currently stands, the scheme of shipbuilding projects in the Defence Capability Plan creates gaps for the Australian shipbuilding industry with a decline in project activity that has already commenced. These peaks and troughs further deny industry the serious opportunity to invest, develop skills and improve performance over the longer period. What assurance can the minister provide to the Australian people that we will not allow a gap to occur in Australian shipbuilding industry again, and that maintaining and growing current capacity is a national security priority? The minister. Mr. President, in May the government released the Future Submarines Industry Skills Plan. Uh, the government is committed to acquiring 12 future submarines to be assembled in Adelaide. The future, I know that's. Uh, uh, warmly endorsed by Senators 
uh, government senators from South Australia who work very hard to uh, refine this policy and to nurture this policy. Uh, the future submarines. Order. Order. Uh, the future submarines will be the biggest, the biggest, preeminently pre the leader of the government in the Senate, who's interest in this matter uh, has been so marked and uh, distinguished her political career. The future submarines will be the biggest and most complex defence project Australia has undertaken. Uh, the Future Submarine Industry Skills Plan was commissioned to identify what is required to build and sustain the skills to deliver the submarines. It was in consultation Time's with CEOs. Expired. Senator Madigan. Thank you, Mr. President. In a recent media release, AMW National Secretary Glenn Thompson stated, with regards to the Australian shipbuilding industry and our currently planned but non-funded order for naval vessels that we are heading to the valley of death. Can the minister explain what, if any, attempts are being made to help Australian shipyards build quality ships for Australia and the world? Um, minister. Mr President, I can uh, inform the uh, senator that uh, to provide more stable work for the industry and retain critical skills for the future submarine project, the government will first, at the earliest opportunity, replace Australia's supply ships HMAS Success and HMAS Sirius. This will include examination of options for local, for hybrid and overseas build. Second, has, has, has brought, forward, brought forward the replacement of Australia's Armadale class patrol boats to be assembled here in Australia. Three, we'll give consideration to bringing forward replacement of the Anzac class frigates with a new frigate to be assembled in Australia. This will include further investment in the Australian radar technology already in service in the Navy frigates. Four, has made key decisions on the future submarines. And five, will implement the future submarine industry skills plan. So that is our plan. Being implemented. Order. Time's expired for asking the question. Before I call Senator Humphreys, I draw attention to honourable senators in the gallery of former Senator Santo Santoro. Welcome. Um, Senator Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. I refer to the interview Mr. Rudd gave with Kerry O'Brien on the 7.30 report on 12 May 2010, in which he blamed failure at Copenhagen on his decision to axe his proposed carbon tax and said, Now it might be easy for you to sit in 7.30 report land and say that was easy to do. Let me tell you, mate, it wasn't. That is why we've announced a decision that we will not seek to introduce this legislation until global action has been adequate. End of quote. Given that any adoption of a new international climate change agreement has been deferred until 2015, and won't take effect until 2020, will Mr Rudd stay true to his 2010 statement and now axe Ms Gillard's carbon tax until global action has been adequate and there is a new international agreement in place? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Senator Wong. So thank you, thank you uh, Mr President, and I, I thank the Senator for what uh, I believe will be his last question. I have to, have to say I anticipated on the public service. No well, I'm glad Senator no McDonald. Senator McDonald is demonstrating the hubris for which is he has become so loved on his side. For which he has been become so loved on his side. And if he could see their heads drop whenever he talks, he would know with what regard he is not held. But anyway, I digress. I digress. Uh, Mr President, as I said, I, I thank the Senator for what I understand will be his last question in this place. And When there's silence, Senator Wong, uh, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, I think there are really a, a couple of propositions to which I, I, I should respond. First is the principle of a carbon price. and I do recall that uh, uh, Senator Humphreys at one time was amongst those senators who did understand the importance of pricing carbon. Uh, and uh, uh, The importance of pricing carbon was, of course, keenly understood by Prime Minister Howard. Uh, and, uh, this party has been very clear in our continued advocacy and delivery of a price on carbon, at times in very difficult political circumstances because of uh, uh, the, uh, the partisanship 
uh, that was demonstrated by those opposite. But the second point in the question, Mr. President, is the proposition in relation to international action, uh, and this is a, a sort of a sort of uh, liberal version of the National Party saying that we don't want any uh, foreign investment, we don't want to pretend there's any global economy out there we're part of. Because the facts are uh, that action is being taken in many countries around the world, and I'd make the point, and I'll, I'm sure I'm happy to come back to this, uh, that uh, we, we are seeing action in California and nine other US states. Korea has legislated its first national emissions trading scheme. Japan introduced a carbon price, carbon taxes, and new regional emissions trading schemes commenced in Time's Canada. Expired. Time's expired. Order. Senator Humphrey. Uh, I thank the minister. Is it still the intention of the government to allow a carbon tax hike of 5 per cent next week, despite the absence of a binding global agreement, not bilateral agreements, a binding global agreement that Mr Rudd had previously set as a prerequisite <coughs> for the introduction of, of any carbon tax? The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, and first, uh, the, the, the point about uh, dismissing bilateral or unilateral action, that isn't the approach that the coalition takes when it comes to trade. And so one wonders, one wonders why they suddenly say, in relation to climate policy, we are going to ignore what China is doing, what the United States is doing, what Korea is doing, what Japan is doing. We're going to ignore that. Well, uh, that, that is, that is, it makes it, again an example of the economic irrationality uh, of those options. Sen Senator, Wong, to... Senator Wong, just resume your seat. Those on my left, if you are silent, uh, Senator Humphreys is on his feet. Senator Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. President. My question was about whether the government will allow a 5 per cent hike in the carbon tax next week. It's only a few days away. Can the minister enlighten the Senate on that question? I believe the minister is addressing the question. The minister still has 35 seconds remaining. To the minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, the second part of the question, I think, dealt with uh, the issue the senator has raised in his point of order, uh, and I would make that point. I think the proposition that is being asserted by the, the opposition again today, as well as yesterday, is that the government should say that what has been passed through this parliament, through this chamber, and the other place, what is the law of the land, should somehow be unilaterally waived by the government of the day. Now, I suspect, in relation to any legislation, any other legislation, if that were the proposition that the government put in place, you could hear the howls from those opposite Order. already. Order. Time President. has expired. Order. Senator Humphreys. Thank you, Mr President. Um, given, given Mr Rudd was arguing against implementing a carbon tax at the time of his original knifing as Prime Minister, can the minister tell the Senate whether Mr Rudd now backs Labor's current carbon tax and how the Australian people can have any confidence in what he will do with respect to the carbon tax in future? The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, uh, the Labor Party's position is we support carbon pricing. That is the position of the party. That is the position of the Prime Minister. And that puts us in stark contrast to the flat earth policy of those opposite, which will cost the economy more, which will cost Australian families more, and will be disruptive to business and business confidence were it ever to be implemented. And, Mr. President, I now ask that further questions be placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of answers given by Senator Wong to questions asked by Senator Brandis and myself. Division, seething hatreds and revenge are the new paradigm in this dysfunctional Labor government. Honour, integrity, loyalty are foreign concepts without any use in their internal treachery. When specifically asked today, the Leader of the Government could not tell us why, for any policy reason, the Prime Minister was removed and, of course, the Deputy Prime Minister was removed, the Leader of the Government in the Senate was removed, the three highest positions in the land were all removed last night, and when asked what was the policy reason for
for this manoeuvre, no answer was provided. No rationale proffered whatsoever. I wonder why that might be. Pretty simple answer. Because there is no answer, there is no policy rationale for the wholesale slaughter of the leadership and cabinet members last night. Those changes last night had nothing whatsoever to do with the welfare of the Australian people. Those changes last night had nothing to do with a new policy direction for this nation. The changes last night were all about Labor desperately trying to preserve themselves. Of itself, Labor's turmoil is irrelevant, other than Labor is supposed to be the government of our great nation. Labor's new team's approach is revenge on those within and attack on Mr Abbott without. Personalised, non-stop, ugly negativity. They have no first-term agenda or record to run on. Why? Because they sacked their first-term Prime Minister, remember? So let's turn to the second term. Well, they sacked their second term Prime Minister as well. So what's their policy going to be as they lead in asking the Australian people to endorse them for a third term? Oh well, we've got the first term Prime Minister that we sacked for incompetence returning to you to deliver a third term government. A third term government solely built on revenge on those within and attack on Mr Abbott. So, Mr uh, Deputy President, I simply say to the Australian people, there is an alternative. It's a genuine alternative. It's a 50-page plan of real solutions for the problems being faced by the Australian people. Might I also say that with this change of the deck chairs comes the real risk of the destruction of documents on which Mr Rudd has form whilst he was with the Queensland Government. So I table a letter written by myself to the Prime Minister requesting a guarantee that certain documents deliberately withheld by the former Prime Minister and Mr Shorten will be preserved, especially given the Australian Information Commissioner's preliminary view that the documents appear to be official documents despite the Prime Minister's office trying to assert to the contrary. Documents that go to ministerial integrity for the former Prime Minister, the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Minister for Workplace Relations. We will be watching the actions of this government very carefully in that particular space. But, Mr Deputy President, the Australian people simply do deserve better. Seven, seven cabinet ministers were destroyed last night. Eight now, and, and the tally goes up. And of course, before that, Minister Ferguson was destroyed. Senator Kim Carr was destroyed. And so the list goes on. A dysfunctional government, more interested in itself, more interested in the internecine warfare within the Labor Party rather than delivering good government for the Australian people. The Australian people are entitled to expect better from their government, and simply recycling the first term failure as the front man for the third term attempt will not cut the mustard, nor should it. Because until the Labor Party can explain the policy rationale for the change, it is obvious there is no real Thank you, genuine Senator change. Thank you, Senator Your time has expired. Senator Abetz, do you wish to seek leave to table that document? Yes, I do. Thank you. Is it has been granted? circulated. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I Senator, thank the Senate. Senator Collins. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. What is noteworthy in not only the questions asked by Senator Abetz and Senator Brandis, but indeed all opposition questions in question time today, is the absence of this opposition to use question time, albeit today the last available question time, to present any sensible alternative. Instead, we see 
we see the slurs, the innuendo, of which indeed we are accused. Order on so my left. Let, me, Order. let me give you a few examples Order. from uh, some of the commentary in question time today. That we on this side are motivated solely by our own self interest, that we have no values, derogatory references to the word mate. I wonder sometimes whether senators on the other side understand how their commentary looks. I really do wonder if they see how their presentation appears to everyday people that deserve better from both a government and an opposition. Certainly there has been division in the Labor Party. There is no question about that. And that has now been settled. The leadership, has, the leadership of the Labor Party issue has been settled, will remain settled and will remain clear. And we now, we now, unlike those on the other side, we now will be solely focused on the needs of Australians, unlike the carping and the carry-on that occurs from the other side. As Senator Betts just highlighted, oh, it's all about revenge and knives and axes, attacks. He holds up a glossy, vacuous 50-page document, as Mr Abbott has now for months. For months. And what's more notable about that document isn't so much what it says, it's what it does not say. What it does not say. And there are countless policy areas that we could go through there. Instead, we know what the Labor government does say, but we know what we can do better. Senator Betts claims that we couldn't talk about what policy needs to be changed or what would be different. Well, what we do know, what we do know very clearly is that we can and do need to make a clearer message. We need to develop policy and promote it better. We understand that, and that is something we can do in the interests and focus on the needs of Australians. So we can better deliver what has already been delivered in terms of a strong economy and a AAA rating of our economy, of protecting jobs in ways this opposition would never have, of promoting education, on achieving consensus in disability care and generally in education as well, on improving superannuation for Australians, things this opposition would never do. We will confront this election with a very stark difference. The vacuum of policy on this side, the failure to present an alternative government as demonstrated in question time today. There was no alternative government presented from the other side. They are incapable of doing it. They could not even receive a compliment from a departing senator without interrupting it. Problems amongst their own colleagues, which was very sorry to see. The policy position from this opposition is not just about the fact that Mr Abbott continues to say no. It's about the failure to develop sensible, reasonable positions that will preserve the needs and the interests of the Australian people. And that is where, as a government, we do have a clear track record. We can acknowledge the global circumstances we have been within. We can protect Australian jobs and the Australian economy. We can improve our education system. We can improve the treatment of people with disability in this country in a way in which our resources show we should. These are all things that we can do and in a way which achieves consensus amongst the Australian people to improve things we know we can do better. There is no question in a range of policy areas we can and do need to improve how we reach people and the message we give Australian people about our values and why we are the Australian Labor Party. But when the other side says things like Senator Brandis just is now, you are us, I mean he's glib, he's very funny, not really. Not really. Well, I didn't hear myself say it, Senator Brandis. No, what I have said, what I have said is Thank the you, Labor Party Senator Collins, will your time has give expired. Australians a much clearer message. Senator Brandis. Mr Deputy President, for those who are students of history, the events of the last 24 hours, extraordinary and spectacular events, constitute 
the greatest political collapse of a government in Australian federal political history. There have been times of turbulence on both sides of politics because that is in the nature of politics. But never before in 112 years has an incumbent government so comprehensively collapsed. With the announcement about half an hour ago of Mr Stephen Smith that he would not be recontesting the election and would be leaving the cabinet, we have had in the last 24 hours the resignation from the cabinet of no fewer than eight, eight of the 22 members of cabinet, more than a third. That has never happened on either side of Australian politics before. And that fact alone tells you how unprecedented is the turmoil that has beset the Australian government. The sad reality is, and it's an ugly sight on display for all Australians to see on their television news and current affairs shows, is that the political party that constitutes the government of Australia at the moment, the Australian Labor Party, is deeply riven by the most poisonous personal hatreds and antagonisms that we have ever seen on either side of Australian politics. And that's not just me saying that, Mr Deputy President. That's what they say about themselves. That's what they say about themselves. Right. So we have lost eight of the 22 cabinet ministers overnight. But what I want to know, Mr Deputy President, and this was the point of the questions I and my colleagues asked of Senator Wong, what of some of those who are staying, who have in the past expressed their contempt and lack of confidence in Kevin Rudd, starting with Senator Penny Wong herself, who said that she didn't consider that he was the right person or had the right temperament to be the Prime Minister of Australia. Yet not only does she continue to sit in his cabinet, but she's been one of the beneficiaries of this political upheaval because she has become the leader of the government in the Senate. What about Mr Gary Gray? the Minister for Resources and Energy. This is what Mr Gary Gray said about Kevin Rudd only last week. Quote, he doesn't have the courage and the strength that's required to do this job. What he can do is spread confusion. How can you have a government when one of the senior members of it, who continues to sit in the cabinet, not six days ago, described the new Prime Minister as a man without the courage and the strength that's required for the job of Prime Minister. What about Mr Tony Burke, who continues to sit in the Cabinet, who last year described the first period of the Rudd government in these words, quote, and the stories that were around of the chaos, of the temperament, of the inability to have decisions made they're not stories." Unquote. That's what Mr Tony Burke said about Mr Kevin Rudd. Yet Mr Tony Burke continues to sit in his cabinet. Or Mr Brendan O'Connor, who last year said this about the 2010 election campaign, speaking about Mr Kevin Rudd. Quote, there were some unbelievable leaks during an election campaign. That is unprecedented in Labor's history, that we would have leaks coming out of the cabinet to target the then Prime Minister during the election campaign and to aid and abet Tony Abbott to win the 2010 election. The destabilisation, the treachery, has now gone on to varying degrees of the last, in the last 18 months. And he was talking about Mr Kevin Rudd. So we have eight of the 22 members of the Cabinet have resigned, refused to serve, would rather sit on the back bench or go in re into retirement than serve with Kevin Rudd, and at least another four who don't have the moral courage to do what the others do, did and resign, who are on the record saying they have no trust or confidence in this man. Thank you, Senator Randers. Senator Cameron. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Mr uh, Deputy President. Senator Brandis says he is uh, a, a historian. 
of politics. Well, let me go back to some of the history. You know, some problems in either the Labour Party or the coalition is not new. Leadership challenges are not new. And if you go back, I can go back to 1983, I can go back further than that. We have 75, Fraser versus Snedden, 82, Fraser versus Peacock, 1983, Peacock versus Howard, 1985, Howard versus Calton, 1987, Howard versus Peacock, 1989, Peacock versus Howard. Then we had a doozy in 1990, Hewson versus Reith versus Webster. Then we went to 1993, Hewson again versus Howard. 1994, Downer versus Hewson. Move on to 2007, Nelson versus Turnbull. 2008, Turnbull versus Nelson. 2009, Abbott versus Turnbull. You know, so if you want to have some analysis of uh, issues in terms of politics and challenges in politics, well, I think it is a bit hypocritical for the coalition to come here and argue that the Labour Party is the only party that has got issues with leadership. Well, leadership is always an issue in the coalition. It always has been and it always will be. And it's not just fights over leadership. Let, us, let me tell you about the big fight within the coalition. It was a fight between the, you know, that, the, the guy who thought he was a great treasurer Peter Costello and the Prime Minister John Howard. And we had a period where, in the, the time that we had Peter Costello as Treasurer, where he didn't have the guts, he didn't have the backbone to stand up to John Howard, and he didn't have the guts and backbone to stand up for this nation because he allowed John Howard to throw good money after bad money on tax cuts that, are, that then meant that we could not invest in the infrastructure in this country. We could not invest in children's education. We could not invest in a national disability insurance scheme. We could do none of those things because there was absolute turmoil during the whole period of the Howard government between John Howard and Peter Costello. And who won that battle? It was John Howard won that battle, much to the regret of those who wanted to try and build this country. And I don't, don't take my word for it. Go back to what one of our most eminent political uh, commentators say, Peter, Th Peter Hatcher in the Sydney Morning Herald on the 25th of April 2009. He said at the heart of the Howard government's manage of the, management of the economy was a raging, unending argument. And the reason was simple. According to Peter Costello, the Prime Minister believed the public would be grateful to the government for new spending and they would vote accordingly. So it was one big bribe from the coalition. No economic position. No building for the future, no spending on public schools. Public schools were diminished under the Howard government. Health was diminished under the Howard government. So I won't accept for one minute any lectures about instability and any lectures about economic credibility from those economic incompetents across the aisle. I will not accept that for one minute. Even Arthur Senator Sinodinus. What did he say? This is his former, Howard's former chief of staff, now a senator here. He said, there was a lucky dip feel as officials and ministers scrambled to formalise tax cut options and decide which ones would get the go-ahead. Well, we don't do that. What we do is we invest in health, we invest in education, we invest in infrastructure, we invest in the NBN. We make sure that the issues we take up are building this economy and building this nation, not like the economics, economic incompetence across the thank chamber. Thank you, Senator Cameron. Senator Joyce. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy President. Well, um, 
welcome to the House of Atreus. It's, it is the most bizarre place. I always, I always wanted, I always wanted to know what it was like to live in a Greek tragedy, and, and here we're in it, in the middle of it. It is bizarre. It is the most internecine, crazy place. We now have the prospect where I, I know the Labor Party's policy. If, we, if you get two for the price of one, if you vote for one prime minister, you're bound to get two of them in every term. And, and what actually happens with the fortunes of the House of Atreus becomes obviously the, the House of Rudd. It's the fortunes of the Labor Party. And now we are seeing all the manifestations of that uh, rather bizarre prototype of a prime minister um, revisiting us. We knew it was getting ugly when we saw Mr Rudd parading through the airport with his sleeping bag. With his sleeping bag. He was obviously a little bit tired. He was going to nod off. So he was parading through the airport with the sleeping bag just to let you know that he was going to the sleep out. Because we all carry our sleeping bags through the airport. I mean, I can't get through Canberra Airport without my sleeping bag under my arm. And then, of course, when you're at the sleep out, you must have a media contingent there for when you wake up. It's extremely important. When you wake up, when you're putting your teddy bear aside and it's time for, you know, time for Noddy to wake up, you've got to have the media there just to know that, thank the Lord, you are awake. You are awake. And this is... Um, we are, and now we've also got the, and before we had the, we're back to the slow walks through the car park, the you know the prophetic glimpses, the the side the the side looks, the walking with the camera, walking with the camera. Here comes the bride in the big fluffy white dress, walking to the camera, walking out the door, walking to the car park, walking to the car. This is the new world, this mad, mad, mad world that we've returned to. And we're back to zipping. We're zipping here. We're zipping there. We're rocking around the country. <laughs> and, um, and it's not surprising that not only have we got a new Prime Minister, but because of this insanity, we have a new Prime Minister. Uh, we lost the Prime Minister in one night. The Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Leader of the Senate, that is the highest office holder, the second highest office holder, and the third highest office holder, all in one night. That is like the left bow, the right bow, and the joker, all gone. And then we also lost the uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, the Minister for Agriculture, the Minister for Communications, the Treasurer. And we, what are we saying? That this is sanity? And is this what we're offering to the Australian people? Buy this product. This one will work. This one will work. If you went to your accountancy practice and walked in the door and said, who are you people? And they said, oh, we just decided last night to change everybody. You'd say, give me my books back. See you later. If you went into a, into a dentist and all of a sudden there was just some manic confusion and change of staff as they pulled out the drill to stick it in your mouth, you'd get out of there too sweet. But these people aren't your dentists. These people aren't your accountants. They're actually running the country. They're running. We actually, we don't actually know who's running the country. Maybe, maybe Lord Howes is running the country. Maybe he is. Maybe, maybe, he's, maybe he's running the country now. Who would know? But this, and, we, and next thing we know, and this is the next thing, of course, when's the election? Have we noted that Mr. Mr. Zip Zip has decided that he's not quite zipping to an election? No, he's going to wait a little while. I can see that happening because he wants to go back to the lodge. It's merely weeks. He wants to go back there. He's moving the furniture back in. Um, but. Don't worry, he'll be sustained on a regular diet of airline food as he goes to every sundry country in the world twice before the election, just to make sure that we've got the people of the Sotho on side, just to make sure we're, we're moving the dynamics of, of things in the Laotian jungles, just to make sure that peace reigns in Cyprus. We will have the Prime Minister of Australia for these last few weeks in every far-flung corner of the world and giving us press conferences telling us about the importance of the things that he is doing. Whilst, meanwhile, back in Australia, we head towards $370 billion in gross debt. 
while well, meanwhile back in Australia our unemployment rises, while well, meanwhile back in Australia we have the crash in the cattle market, while well, meanwhile back in Australia chaos reigns. Thank you, Senator Joyce. Uh, I'll put the question, uh, and that is the motion moved by Senator Abetz be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those again say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Ludden, I'm on a separate matter. On a completely different matter, Deputy President. I just move that the Senate take note of the answers that uh, Foreign Minister Bob Carr provided uh, earlier to Senator Milne on the issue of refugees and of the issue of fleeing violence, war and ethnic cleansing in our region and from further afield, and how they are treated when they reach Australia. Minister Carr gave an extraordinary interview on Late Line last night, right in the teeth of the remarkable events of yesterday that some certainly um, from the crossbenchers are starting to feel are getting more than a little repetitive. But nonetheless, following the extraordinary events of yesterday, Minister Carr conducted an extraordinary and, and uh, quite offensive interview with Tony Jones on Late Line, where he effectively, I think, laid out where it appears the Labor Party wanted to take the refugees issue as a political tactic, if you will, not as a humanitarian emergency but a cheap political tactic. And Mr Jones asked Bob Carr, Minister Carr, um, what Kevin Rudd, the new Prime Minister, is likely to do to uh, change the national conversation, as it was put. And Minister Carr, while uh, looking down his nose on those of noble sentiments on the issue, wanted to, I think, redefine what we think of as a refugee in the first place. If this so-called spike, this huge number of people who are on the move, not just into Australia but around the world, are, are a political inconvenience for the Labor Party that has never had the backbone to stand up to the gutter tactics of the opposition and has simply followed them into the gutter, if that has become politically inconvenient enough that it looks as though it might lose them seats, then why don't we just redefine what we call a refugee? And Minister Carr said, we've reached the view that as a result of court and tribunal decisions, it's coming up wrong. The 93-odd per cent of people who are fleeing these situations of horror and violence overseas are being found to refugees. The courts are delivering the wrong answer. And so, of course, in Minister Carr's assessment, we need a tougher, more hard-edged assessment. What he means by that is, we'll just change the definition. At the stroke of a pen, you're not a refugee at all. You're just some kind of economic parasite fleeing at the, uh, at the behest or, or using the agency of the people smuggler networks. You are no longer able to call on Australia for safe harbour, as people have been able to do since the horror of the Second World War and the aftermath of that, the drafting of the refugee conventions. No, no. In Minister Carr's assessment, whether he's trying to lead the direction that a future Rudd government would take or whether he's just off on some uh, um, tangent of his own is to redefine those people as not refugees at all. They are not people fleeing persecution, he says. They're coming from majority regions or ethnic groups in the country. They're fleeing. They're coming here as economic migrants, and there is an unsustainable spike in their numbers. So it has become an unsustainable political inconvenience for those in the Labor Party, good people, many of them who stood with the Greens in former times against the horrors and the excesses of the way in which the Howard government conducted the gutter politics of people fleeing violence and persecution, and now the Labor Party has joined them there. And last night, and again in question time in response to Senator Milne this afternoon, Minister Carr raised the stakes even further. If the courts are doing something inconvenient, finding these pesky refugees as being gen genuine refugees, in the range of 93 to 95 per cent, found to be genuine refugees, very, very small numbers of people relative to our overall population, but in larger numbers than we've known before because of the instability and violence in our region and what people have suffered in the last few years. If that has become politically inconvenient for the Labor Party, then why not just redefine them as economic refugees? If you've got 50 bucks in your pocket or if you've been able to pay somebody to get you on a boat rather than spending the rest of your life in some camp in a so-called queue that's going nowhere. You're therefore an economic, you're an economic migrant, according to Foreign Minister Bob Carr. The Greens will stand against this kind of abuse, this kind of cheap political tactics at the expense of some of the most vulnerable people on earth. The Greens will insist that Australia remain a safe harbour for people fleeing 
wars and ethnic cleansing in our region and in other parts of the world. And if the Labor Party is choosing to abandon that principle in the teeth of an election, then we will spend however long the new Prime Minister decides it should take before there is an election and let it be sooner rather than later. We will take that issue right up through and beyond the next election so that people will have no doubt at all who is maintaining that humanitarian spirit in this parliament. I hope the Labor Party will rethink this one and that somebody draws Minister Carr back into line. Thank you, Senator Ludlam. I put the question that the motion moved by Senator Ludlam be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any ministerial statements? Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I present two ministerial statements relating to uh, for full knowledge and concurrence on joint defence facilities and securing a stronger, smarter, fairer tax system. Are there any government responses to committee reports? Oh, I beg your pardon, Senator Ludlam. Peter, I just seek your guidance. I would, uh, I would like to, to speak to the full knowledge and concurrence report, if that's an appropriate time now. You, you'll have to, you have to seek leave. leave, and then you can move a motion to take note of that report. Thanks, Deputy. That statement. Uh, I'll, I'll seek leave to take note of that report. Is leave granted? Leave is, leave is granted briefly, Senator Ludlam. Briefly. I'll ch have to check the standing orders. Um, I move that the Senate take note uh, of, the, of the report that uh, Minister Collins has just presented on behalf of uh, former Defence Minister, I guess I call him now, uh, Smith, and acknowledge his comments in the other place as, uh, as he has chosen not to recontest the next election. This is a remarkably timed uh, document from the former Defence Minister on our apparent full knowledge and concurrence about United States military and intelligence bases in this country. I say it's incredibly timed given that it comes in the wake of the PRISM scandal which, um, with some degree of success, I think, both of the old parties have managed to avoid even treating it as a scandal, as it is in every other world capital, by simply not making eye contact, pretending that it will all go away. Of course it won't, but nonetheless. In this statement, we have the Australian government declaring that it has full knowledge of what's going on in the United States bases on our territory. When several members of the United States Congress, and even a member of the Homeland Security Committee, have very recently expressed dismay that they had no idea how invasive and vast their own NSA's surveillance activities are. So how remarkable that Australian policymakers and uh, defence minister and staff have been brought into the loop that not even United States senior uh, congressional representatives have been given. Intelligence officials, not on the record, but intelligence officials have told Fairfax reporters in off-the-record statements that parliamentarians, or more in these off-the-record statements, than parliamentarians have been able to extract from ministers in this place about the PRISM system. So we learned, for example, that the, um, the new facility, the data uh, centre not too far from Canberra, uh, uh, that, is, that is under construction at the moment, is being used to store material, or will be used to store material that's being extracted from PRISM by uh, colleagues of, of the ASD and ASIO in the United States. And we found that out in the Fairfax Press because when we put a motion up in here to have the Attorney General table a statement or make a statement to this parliament, he refused, or both of the old parties refused to do so. Senator Xenophon and myself have asked questions on and without notice, which have been entirely fobbed off about how much the Australian government knows about the massive surveillance overreach of citizens and whether the privacy of Australians has been breached. We know that it has. Don't treat us like children. We know what is occurring here. I think it would have been helpful for some transparency around the scope of the surveillance overreach rather than just going into, into some kind of denial lockdown. So it is just as well that Fairfax journalist Phil Dawling is on the case, as there are, I mean, there are so few good national security journalists in this country. There are a number, um, and Mr Dawling is certainly one of them, because without this small handful of people who actually track these issues closely, Australians wouldn't know anything about how our government and intelligence officials have these huge volumes of immensely valuable information derived from PRISM and other US signals intelligence uh, collection programs. So the government says it has full knowledge and concurrence regarding US bases in Australia. Well, maybe that was intended to be comforting. I do not find it so. We're told in the statement around the basing of United States Marines in Darwin. An, acknowledge an, an announcement, of course, that took the Australian people um, and uh, probably also the foreign minister at the time completely by surprise. This is foreign policy conducted by press release after the key decisions have been made behind closed doors. Being presented with a decision after it has been made is not the same as full knowledge and concurrence, actually. 
What knowledge do the Australian people or parliamentarians have about the rights, the roles, the responsibility of US forces while they are here on Australian soil? In November 2012, another Fairfax journalist at the time, Dylan Welsh, um, who is now in Afghanistan, revealed that there was a secret two-page statement of principles relating to Australian and US military collaboration. It is known as the Australian United States Force Posture Review Working Group Statement of Principles. Mr Welsh put in a freedom of information application about that process, and he was told uh, in, that a letter from the Defence Department um, as statement of principles relating to Australian and US military collaboration existed. The DOD was obliged to consult with the US government, which of course told them not to release the document to Mr Welsh. So the Australian people actually still don't have any knowledge of the underpinnings of a significant expansion of the US military presence into Australia. The minister mentions North West Cape in his statement. That's in Western Australia. That's a facility uh, that continues to facilitate, enable and support the passage and deployment of nuclear uh, armed submarines. These are offensive attack weapons platforms. Ballistic missile submarines exist for no other purpose than Armageddon one day. They are not tactical weapons. They are not battlefield scale. They contain ballistic missiles with the intention of destroying cities and ending particular civilizations. That's what they're for. This base at Northwest Cape is about communications with those vessels. Full knowledge and concurrence. Right. Australia thereby legitimises the retention and deployment of nuclear weapons. So while former and current Prime Minister Rudd, I guess it's getting a little bit confusing, and as Foreign Minister work quite hard as a middle power with a bit of diplomatic clout to uh, bring forward the debate around non-proliferation and disarmament through the commission that we co-chaired with the, with the former, former Foreign Minister of Japan. At the same time as that process is trying to get consensus around non-proliferation and disarmament, we are writing into two uh, successive defence white papers that we support the deployment of nuclear weapons in Australia's name. Now that's on paper. On the ground, the existence of facilities like the North West Cape Base are around enabling nuclear weapons deployment not just in our name, but on our soil. Pine Gap, a nuclear weapons target and a key part of the US missile defence program, is of course a major incentive for other nuclear weapon states to keep their arsenals. And we learn in the statement that that plays a great role in counter-proliferation of nuclear weapons. And don't get me wrong, the, uh, the extraordinarily sophisticated monitoring network that Australia supports, it's in our budget, we do that with our international partners around detecting things like clandestine nuclear detonations, weapons tests and so on, strongly support. And we're told that the value of the data obtained on this issue from Pine Gap can't be estimated or underestimated. Um, so Pine Gap has somehow gone from being a, a secret intelligence facility to an, an anti-nuclear weapons establishment, which is remarkable. We're told that through this joint facility, Australia is able to access intelligence. Now, as we know, Pine Gap monitors radar, cell phones, radio and long-distance telecommunications, allowing it to provide targeting information for US air and ground forces, um, including uh, drones and UAVs. And it's, it's extremely valuable because it's in the Southern Hemisphere. The Australian people do not know who the facility spies on or who is targeted. And in 1999, the government refused to provide information about Pine Gap to this parliament's Joint Standing Committee on Treaties. Nothing has changed since then. Although US congressional officials have visited Pine Gap and received classified briefings about its functions, elected representatives and senators are entrusted with less information than can be found online or in a public library. So the Greens support the principle of this government providing statements of explanation such as this. The statement, however, is 90 per cent platitudes and 10 per cent information already in the public domain, rather noticeably absent minus the kind of material that a small handful of national security journalists are making available to the Australian people. Um, it is time that the Australian government actually came clean on, so that the idea of full knowledge and concurrence doesn't become some sort of ironic afterthought once a, uh, um, material is put into the public domain by a future generation of brave whistleblowers. Thank you, Senator Adams. Uh, Senator McEwen.